Heron's books clearly show an understanding of the mechanics of air. He knew that air had substance, it had volume, it was made of particles, and if you pushed it, it would have to go somewhere, and if you sucked it, it would come with you. But could Heron apply these theories to the real world? An opportunity arose when he was challenged to create a bird garden that could move and sing in the total absence of humans or birds. We have reports from visitors to the Byzantine court of numerous mechanical devices, one of which was a tree which contained metallic singing birds. The model works on the basis of water falling from one vessel to another, displacing the air and blowing a series of small water warblers which are contained within the birds. The water enters the system through the lion's mouth and drops into the bowl. From there it runs down into the next vessel below, which is a sealed container. So as the water rushes in, the air in the container is forced out along the tubes and out of the mouths of the warblers, where whistles have been placed. When that container becomes full, it then siphons suddenly into the lower container. And as that fills, the weight of that vessel actually operates the owl, which then turns to look at the birds. As that lower vessel fills up, it reaches a point almost to full and then siphons. The weight then decreases dramatically because the water's going out. The vessel then rises under the influence of the counterbalance weight, turning the owl back into its original position. This makes it a kind of loop system whereby it completes one cycle and then immediately resets itself and starts again. So as long as power is being supplied, the system will cycle continuously. And really, in a sense, this makes it a, perhaps a precursor of what we would now call a robotic machine. The effect would have amazed any audience, let alone one 2,000 years ago. The motivation behind most of these pieces was to create awe and a sense of mystery and to just to accentuate the power, the wealth and the technical expertise of the culture. Heron was a master engineer. He was a master craftsman. He made things happen. He saw the opportunity and he put it together to the limit of the fabrication methods available to them at the time. Heron was truly a giant in the field of early robotics and automated machines, but he was standing on the shoulders of another giant, Philon of Byzantium. Philon's work on mechanics influenced many inventors, including Heron, right up to the present day. Like many modern engineers, Philon was asked to create automatic machines that would make money for his benefactors. Religion was an essential part of life in ancient Alexandria. And it was important that worshippers be clean before entering the temples where they believed their gods lived. How could Alexandrians ensure that there was a ready supply of soap and water at the temple? And could the priests exploit this demand to raise revenue for their holy places? This device is called Philon's automatic soap dispensing machine and it works like this. On the side of the machine is a coin slot here which would have collected money from worshippers uh, visiting the temple. The coin lands in a pan on one end of a lever. The weight causes this end to go down. The other end of the lever pulls upwards and releases a valve that allows water to flow. So when a coin was placed in there, a supply of water would be turned on. And as the vessel filled up, the weight of the vessel would act on a counterbalance shaft. The weight of the full pot turns wheels that are attached to strings. The strings pull open the doors to the machine and at the same time cause a hand to lower. Which presents the worshipper with a ball of soap or in this case pumice. The hand returns inside the machine and is automatically reloaded with soap. After a few seconds the vessel reaches its siphon point and it dumps the water in a fairly continuous stream for several seconds down through the device through the pipe in the lion's mouth thus allowing the worshipper to actually wash their hands using the pumice ball. These examples of technology designed by Philon are some of the very earliest machines that we could truly call automatic. For a device which is something like 2,250 years old, this is just mind-blowing. It's a staggering achievement. 
The exact same principles of this dispenser still drive many of our machines today, nearly two and a half thousand years later. One could argue that this device was the forerunner of the modern soap dispensers that you find in wash rooms. Philon, Heron and others in the Alexandrian school created the world's prototype robots and automated machines. Machines that self-regulated. Machines that always did the same thing time after time. And this guarantee of continuity was much valued on the other side of the world, in China. The ancient Chinese were impressive long-distance traders, map makers and adventurers. And it was important to them that they always knew which was the way home. And which was the direction of their capital, Beijing. So how did the ancient Chinese solve the problem? The answer lay in a high-tech chariot fitted with a programmable direction finder used around 2600 BC. At all times, the figure which was mounted on top of the chariot would point to the capital city. Ludo Verheyen of MTE Studios has reconstructed a full-scale model of this fascinating machine. Yeah, this project was indeed uh, quite a challenge. It was the first time that this, um, this uh, features have been reconstructed ever and the mechanics involved was really a challenge. As Ludo rotates the device, the statue on top always points the same way, whichever way the chariot turns. But how does it work? It's a highly sophisticated geared mechanism which is very, very similar to the device that we find in almost every modern car, which we would now call a differential gear. The gearbox effectively is measuring the speed between two wheels. As one wheel moves faster than the other, as it does when turning a corner, it alters the position of the figure which is mounted above the chariot. When the cart turns to the right, the right-hand wheel turns a cog inside the machine. This turns the central gear, which rotates the figure. Because the right-hand gear has rotated more than the left, the figure is turned more towards the left. So as the cart turns right, the figure turns left to compensate. The result is that the pointing statue appears not to have turned at all and always points in the same direction. No matter where the chariot moves, how it twists and turns, the figure should always remain pointing in the same direction. Departing Chinese travelers orientated the statue when leaving the city and it would have remained pointing in that direction for the duration of the journey. To all intents and purposes, I think it would be fair to claim that this is a robotic device. It was an incredibly important invention and has had a huge impact on the technology of the last hundred years in particular. But there's intriguing evidence that the ancients designed machines that could perform several actions simultaneously. Could the world's first supercomputer have been designed almost a thousand years ago? The science of robotics was surprisingly advanced in the ancient world, but how were their machines powered? If you go back 2,000 years, they didn't have batteries, they didn't have electrical outlets, and this was a real problem for them. One reliable source of energy in the ancient world was water, and one of the most complex water-driven machines was a forerunner of today's synthesizer organs. Rodney Briscoe is fascinated by these ancient instruments. The water rises in the top of the tank here, where it falls through these tubes. You get a vortex and it sucks in air, so you get a mixture of air and water, then descending into the tank at the bottom, where the water would pass out and the air pressure would then be transferred to the organ. And the air passes up into the wind chamber here, where the, the cylinder turns, is operated by the water wheel, by the same water from the tank at the top. It opens the valves and lets the air through into the pipes and the pipes play. Let's try it. Rather than having water falling through gravity like a waterfall, Rodney is using an electric pump. There, the water is now entering the top chamber and falling down into the system below to create the air. And it's now turning the wheel and making the music just as it would have done thousands of years ago. Pins on the rotating drum lift levers that open the valves and allow the air into the pipes. But there was a machine in the ancient world that used water not for power as such, but as an integral part of the mechanics. 